questions for Raquel? Yeah, and when you drive, some mistakes are worse than others. There's head-on collisions or there's just rolling through a stop sign. Do the uh, procedures you use differentiate between the different costs of different kinds of mistakes, or are all mistakes treated alike? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, right now, the metrics for perception systems are not based on the end goal. And this is one of the things that is actually missing, is linking control planning with perception. And that's, you know, uh, what we're going right now with, uh, with our research in order to really understand which mistakes really matter. And when we label pixels, right, every pixel is not equally important. So that's a fantastic question, and it's exactly where, where we're getting at, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, you have shown us how uh, the car can find objects, track them, even predict their intentions, and then localize itself and do a number of tasks. Mm -hmm. But I haven't understood how all of these sources of information are integrated in a decision. So that part of the chain of decisions I missed. Yeah, yeah, so you're exactly asking the same question. So what I showed you today was sensing, perception, and mapping. I even show you control. Right, so it, this is what you need to, this is typically the input to the control system. Uh, so I don't do control, right? Uh, so I don't know control yet. Uh, soon, uh, soon I will be doing control as well. Um, but the idea here is, so typically, whether it's a later or not, you take those bounding boxes, you take that prediction, and then it gets, you know, you typically don't, reason too much about uncertainty and you pass that to your planner, to your control module. Okay, and what, and this is a bad idea because then uh, you haven't trained your perception system to actually understand to what finally is it gonna be used for. And that's what I was saying is that the next step here is really to train everything for, for control. Now, uh, I am in academia, it's very difficult to do control in academia. Right, so because you need, you know, to be able to have access to many, many, many cars, many, many, many hours of driving, and we don't have resources, uh, uh, particularly in Canada, we don't have resources for that. Yeah. So, um, when it when it comes to control. Sorry. Uh, so we, okay. Yeah. We'll go ahead. Oh, I was told to come to the mic. Here ahead, but, uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, so when it, when it comes to control and you know. Driving in general, we're going to be asked a lot about uh, trust and safety, yes. and this you know sort of connects with the um, with the previous speaker with Vint was saying you know he doesn't trust sitting in a massage chair. Um, we're going to have to you know be trusting cars on the road, and this is something that's brought up a lot. I think it's going to be you know with machine learning throughout this meeting, we're going to be talking about how can we mm -hmm. um, trust. Uh, the, the correctness of the algorithms. On the other hand, when it comes to driving right now, the drivers, the human drivers on the road have been trusted after a 15 minute driver's test. I have a 16 year old son. I can't prove to you that he drives safely. In fact, I can prove to you he doesn't drive safely. He's grounded from the car right now. But, um, and yet everybody on the road accepts him as a driver. Um, we're gonna, how how uh, are you thinking about, and maybe this is for others as, as well in this room, um, Thinking about what is the right standard for an autonomous car? Does it, you know, we can, if we we can't prove its correctness, presumably with your algorithms, and yet what standard do we need to let to allow it to be on the car, given the standards we have for human drivers? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, let's see. So the first thing to say is that you know we are okay with humans making mistakes. We are not okay with machines making mistakes. And I think that's the first thing that we need to understand why that's the case, right? So so uh, and one of the uh, the questions really is. When do we believe that machines are so much better than humans that we are okay with the fact that they will still make some mistakes? Right? And, and I don't have an answer for that. Um, the other thing is we have seen a lot of uh, techniques these days that remove perception altogether and directly from pixels try to say, try to predict turn left, turn right. And in, in my opinion, this goes really against interpretability, right? So perception really allows you to have a representation of everything that is in the scene. And then when you make a decision, when you make a, a decision in control, you can say, I have made this decision because there was a car in front of me that was driving with this particular behavior, or because I saw an obstacle in front of the road. Um, so uh, in, my, in my opinion, perception on, in 3D is actually key for having interpretability. That said, right, is um, interpretability comes at very different levels, 
right? The fact that a neural net is a very complicated function, what is really learning, doesn't mean that we cannot interpret uh, or we cannot control the probability of error, we cannot control uh, or get you know, more theoretic theoretical analysis of you know, bounds, confident bounds of what it's going to be doing, or worst case scenario. Uh, so there is a lot to do uh, for particularly machine, machine learning theory in the case of you know, all these uh, deep learning techniques. Um, but uh, you know, the fact that uh, you know, we could replace this with a set of you know, if-else statements, well, I don't think that's interpretable as well either. Right. OK. Um, so. Uh, thanks. Patrick Wolf, uh, good morning and thanks for your talk. Um, two questions, one of which loops back to a comment that you made a little bit earlier. Uh, the first is just, um, uh, it hasn't been talked about yet, but um, we see a lot of different governments looking at investment in infrastructure and things like connected roads. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the, the biggest one or two challenges in your body of work that would be made much easier by or essentially eliminated by a more idealized connected infrastructure. Um, the second question is, is even a little bit broader. Um, if you were working um, with uh, a, a company or, um, or a larger group rather than on your own in academia, uh, what things about your research would be, would be harder and what things would be easier, would be more effective? So you, you, talk, you mentioned a little bit about this before, but I'd really like for the group to be able to get a sense of um, what some of these big challenges look like and, and how the, the academia uh, industry interface is, is likely to look here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let me answer the second question because I think it's a fundamental question uh, that we need to think very seriously, um, which is you know, the link now between uh, academia and industry for things like self-driving cars. So working in self-driving cars is something that is really not cheap. Right, and in order to be able to come up with solutions that we can prove that they actually you know, can drive for many, many millions of miles, etc., we need a lot of resources, and only companies have those resources. Right. Um, also, in terms of uh, you know developing new algorithms that are able to really understand the end-to-end -end process, right, and get into control, one is access to a lot of resources. So I think there is a need for much more integration of academia and industry. That said, what's happening, right, is that there is a lot of money at stake on this. Right? So, so right now, there is not that much of that integration process. It's very secretive, right, for most of the companies, uh, which is actually quite unfortunate. So we've been you know, spending a lot of our resources into trying to put benchmarks out there such that everybody can actually develop uh, new algorithms, right, for mapping, for, for uh, perception. That said, there are still Small scale, right? Even if it's Greater Toronto, it's a thousand kilometers, right? It's still very small compared to the whole world where we have to actually drive. Um, so I think there is a lot more to do in terms of, you know, what is a viable solution for academia and industry, right? Because I can get, you know, a couple of grants, I, you know, I can get one or two cars, right? But I need the engineers, I need so many other things that go with it, right? That's uh, that is difficult. And I guess the first question was, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a fantastic question, right? So, uh, so the question, I guess, uh, maybe this is the perfect setting, right? Is what is the government, uh, you know, ready to invest in terms of, you know, helping us in this task, right? So, for example, every, all the infrastructure has been done for visual perception, right? And it actually makes it quite difficult to drive in because it's all visual. Right, well, by changing a little bit, making sensors active, uh, sorry, making uh, you know, traffic lights active, uh, um, that will help a lot, right? Um, other things, like we see carpool, is carpool, self-driving carpool, uh, the future, right? And then we don't need to handle human drivers, which are very erratic and are actually quite difficult. And there is also you know, weird behaviors that human drivers have with respect to self-driving cars that do not have respect to regular drivers. So there is a lot of very, very interesting questions that if the government was able to invest, right, it would make this go faster. Yes. Uh, it's Vince Cerf uh, again from Google. Uh, the Google company uh, is called Waymo now, the ones mm -hmm. that make uh, the self-driving cars. They noticed also the high cost of the LIDARs and things like that. So they uh, developed their own, and we think the costs are about 10% of what they used to be, so that's the first point. Tesla is building the sensors into mm -hmm. most of their cars uh, before they actually get on the road. 
Uh, one thing that's is very important, I think, and just I'd like to see if you agree. The cars do reasonably well in good weather conditions, but when it's raining and snowing and things like that, it's very hard to see lane markings. And so I haven't seen a lot of cars that do well in bad weather. What's your experience? Um, yeah, so again, is um, um, so very extreme weather conditions, neither humans nor machines will do well. Right, I think that's clear. When we have a snowstorm, it's very difficult to drive, and yes, because it's going to be difficult to drive. Right. Um, in terms of uh, your first point about uh, lidar being ten times uh, cheaper, is it still around eight to ten thousand dollars? Right. So if you think of what the OEMs are willing to put in their cars, you know, software, hardware for computing, and cameras has to be under a hundred dollars. Right, so we are still many orders of magnitude uh, away from from what uh, you know OEMs are able to to uh, to do, um, and yeah, Tesla has you know a good system, but you know Tesla cars are really expensive. Right, um, um, now in terms of the the weather is something that again I would love to have more resources to really investigate uh, what happens. Right, so yes, it's not a matter of algorithms get worse, uh, sensing gets worse. Right, so Velodyne has issues with cold weather. Uh, Velodyne sees exhaust fumes from cars and make perception difficult. Right, is is you know cameras. Uh, you need to figure out okay how to you know clean rain, snow, uh, fog is an issue. Maybe it's, you know some other types of sensors are, are do better. Um, so you know there is a lot of research to be done into making this uh, uh, very reliable. But also we should think of. You know, perhaps we don't need to solve everything from day one, right? Perhaps if we were able to solve certain tasks that we can deploy, we can already help society a lot, right? So even if, you know, the first generation works in relatively good conditions, we can already help, I think, quite a lot into mobility and reducing traffic. Okay. Hi, I, I want to make a, a quick comment on the previous, uh, second previous question and then get to my question, which uh, when we talk about whether the government will invest in infrastructure. I think a better way to phrase that is how do we choose um, between, uh, you know, governments are coordination mechanisms between societies. And so what we're really saying is how much should taxpayers and corporations invest in infrastructure rather than in doing these, or, or how much should we uh, focus it all on, as you say, the corporations having very mm -hmm. smart cars. So I think yeah. we, especially in the times now, we should be very clear about what we're really asking. It's not like the government is some bear somewhere that's doing something, right? We, we are the ones who should be controlling it mm -hmm. and making recommendations. Back to my actual question, way earlier in your talk, you said that autonomous cars were going to help with uh, the environment and sustainability. And actually, this is one of my great fears, is yes, we might save a few lives, but are we going to have massively more cars or are the individual cars going, are we going to suddenly get thrown back out from the cities and then spend more of our time uh, commuting because we can actually get work on our laptops while we're commuting? So I, I, I don't see how autonomous cars benefit the environment except, you know, slightly optimizing routes or something. But I don't, I see them as a real hazard to the environment. I see. So, so let me, uh, let me uh, respond with a question. Uh, if there were trains and trams, would it be better? Right? Would you be happy with that? Right, that's what we invest on is trams, at least Toronto, right? Trams, uh, subways, trains, commutes. So think of this as yes, a most flexible way, you know, more, more flexible version of that, right? So right now, I was, I guess, in the Silicon Valley last week, and you see the carpool lane is for two people, right? Which is already, in my opinion, ridiculous. And nobody is there because everybody has its own car. Right, so we need to solve already that problem. It's there. We are not, you know, we are not going to get worse than that, right? But how does that help by autonomous cars? Um, so if we have autonomous cars, right, we can route. We have shared resources. We can route where who who should be picking whom, uh, and you know, and not just be the ones you know owning a car. Right, but think of you know the public transportation of the future being much more flexible. Right now, public transportation doesn't work really well because it's not super flexible. Right, we cannot you know people that live in the suburbs that have options. Right, if we now think and they drive their own car, right. So if you target that population, I think you can make a lot of good. So autonomous so, cars help the environment in the context of public transportation, not, not a private ownership. 
in my opinion, uh, public trans transportation is the way to go. I Yes, but that's we'll, just my we'll opinion. We'll have to continue that discussion in the break. And the gentleman there has been waiting very patiently. All other questions, I think, we'll do in the break. But the gentleman has been. But that's it. I'm, I'm sure that you know some of the uh, uh, people in the audience uh, work mm -hmm. in car co uh, in cellular car companies, so they can maybe they have a different opinion. So to, just to speed things up, I'll, I'll give Raquel my microphone, and Zubin can get set up. Yeah. Hi, hi, Raquel. I'm uh, Joaquin from Facebook. Um, I think on, on the. Before I ask my question, I can't resist to comment on the previous question. Um, I, I think that you have to look at the, at the environmental cost of manufacturing a car. And if car utilization is so incredibly low, uh, you know, presumably you could get away with like building much fewer cars, which again, you know, might make other people unhappy, but that's okay. Um, the, the, the question that I have for you is, you, you didn't talk about performance. So I assume that, by the way, super impressive talk. I, I love the uh, sort of the deep watershed transform work is, is phenomenal. Um, um, how computationally expensive is it to run them? And the, the reason I'm asking is that a lot of the work we're doing actually is in trying to run deep nets in mobile phones, mm -hmm. and it's a whole new game. So I, I, you didn't talk about that specifically, so I was curious about yeah, like, whether you're yeah. doing any work so, on that. So most of the stuff we have done is uh, near real time without uh, going into um, um, fixed precision, without going into compressing networks. Um, so like the watershed is just a feed forward pass independent of the number of instances. So that definitely can run on the car. Okay. And um, what hardware do you run those on? Like the uh, We run them on Titan Nexus, but okay. uh, yeah. Awesome. All right, thank you.